Hey guys, welcome back. Sorry it's been so long since our last video. It feels like we've been going nonstop for the last couple months. For sure. So this video will probably be a little longer, but that's because we've covered so much. Yeah, in this video, we're going to show you the framing of our deck structure, as well as some soffits on the interior of the home that we framed. Our window installation, that's a big one. Soffit and fascia as well as our lap siding and some of our accent mahogany siding as well. If you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe to our channel for more videos. We're building our own modern off-grid home here in the mountains of North Carolina, and we'd love for you to follow along. So let's get into it. Okay, so the first thing we are going to tackle in this video is the deck structure. We need to get this in prior to setting the windows and doors because we need the space outside of the home here to assemble the door. So to accomplish this, the first thing we did is we took a laser and we marked the top of the metal post vertically where the deck band was gonna go. Once we got that done, we temporarily attached it with some clamps. And then we came over to the home side and we put down some vinyl flashing and then we put our band board against the house and secured that with some Simpson screws. Once we got that band board against the house, we started laying out our joists. Now, luckily for us, we plan out the joist spacing in Revit before we start building the home. So that was all done for us and we just had to follow the plan. It's a little interesting here. We had to start at 16 inch on center and then towards the middle of the house, it goes to 14 inch on center and then back to 16 inch on center again for the joist spacing. And that's just to help us duck and dodge these steel brackets and the steel posts that hold the deck up. Once that was done, we started placing the joist and Simpson joist hangers. And we always make sure to crown these, uh, all the crowns going up. And that helps us later on when we go to flatten this out with everything arched up, it's easy just to take a little off the top of the planer before laying the deck boards down. After that was done, we permanently started attaching the deck band to the support post. And these were kind of a pain in the butt because you couldn't get really any leverage on the drill. So my arms were sore and I believe I even had a big bruise on my arm from pulling on the drill so hard. And the key with any large diameter hole here and drilling is just to set your drill for a lower speed and use lubricating oil or else you're gonna burn through drill bits. Once that was done, we permanently attached the deck and then we cut off the tops of the steel post and now we're ready for decking. The next thing to tackle on this house for the exterior was the fascia and soffit. The most difficult part about the siding on this home is definitely the fascia and the soffit. So first thing we did is we blocked for all the soffit and this was done to correct for some of the inconsistencies and the cuts and the eye joists that we made when we framed the house. So cutting at such a steep angle on these eye joists and eye joists aren't flat either so your saw doesn't ride on a flat surface when making a cut, it makes it almost impossible to get these perfectly straight. So we always knew we were gonna have to come back and block this. So we put two by fours on every single joist on the plywood portion and screwed it through the plywood. It was real tricky with, you know, we had multiple string lines going on. We don't want the piece of soffit that meets the house to be one inch on the right side of the wall and then three inches on the left side. So we took extra precaution here with all the angles and the difficulty of this soffit to get everything right. And that really paid off in the long run. So once that was done, we moved on to installing the fascia, which this needed a little work too. Uh, once again, just blocking and moving things and tweaking things until we get a straight run. Uh, we use a string line to check and then we install the fascia, which is just eight inch Mirtek composite fascia. I think it's MDF exterior rated flipped on the smooth side. So it's eight inch on the short sides of the house. And then the big sides of the house were more difficult. That is a 16 inch piece of fascia, which is a pretty big piece of wood. And then we had to bevel cut that to match the angle of the roof, which was probably the most difficult thing about the fascia. On the 
inside of the house, one of the detail items for framing that we had to finish still were the drop soffits. This is a personal preference on design here, but in a lot of homes nowadays, you'll see cabinets that are stacked in the kitchen, you know, let's say to a 10 foot ceiling because nobody really wants a dust shelf anymore. So in older homes, you'll see cabinets that go partially up the wall and then the tops of them are just exposed. So they'll collect dust and some people even put decorative items on top, but that's a little outdated in my opinion. So a lot of people nowadays are running their cabinets all the way to the ceiling to get rid of the dust problem, but it's really inefficient. I've built a lot of homes like this in the past where the, these cabinets are not cheap and unfortunately being that high off the ground, they're never used. So in my opinion, it's a waste of money. We bring down the ceilings to meet the top of the cabinets to get rid of the dust shelf and save a little money by not having to take the cabinets all the way up to the ceiling. So this is pretty critical here. Anytime you're meeting up with cabinets, you need to make sure that everything is straight and as perfect as possible. In this scenario here, the drywall will actually be flush with the face of the cabinets and the cabinets are flat face European style. So everything has to be absolutely perfect. So you see us stretching a string line here and then just putting each joist in one by one, checking and tweaking, and, and then we use screws. That way, if we need to come back and adjust anything, we can. Another thing you'll notice is we've already hung drywall against the ceiling joist before we started building the soffit. This is required by code as a fire block. Well, either half inch drywall or inch and a half of wood, which would be crazy. You'd have to stack two pieces of three quarter inch plywood to get a fire rating here. Now for the moment we've all been waiting for. The excessive amount of glass needs to be installed into this house. The delivery was pretty straightforward except for the track for the large door in our living area, which is 30 feet long approximately, and we had to actually drag it up the hill on a skid because it was just too wide to carry on a forklift given that the road is only probably 20 feet wide um, with the shoulder. The windows, to get our wind rating up here at this elevation, a lot of these windows are special and have special mulls that are plate steel and, and stuff to reinforce these windows against wind. So the windows are a lot heavier than normal and some of them are nine feet tall and uh, came in three or four pieces. So you'll see in the bedroom, these were particularly difficult because on the exterior of the home, you know, we're 20 feet off the ground and try and install windows that weigh probably 700 pounds each. But we got it done, we're used to the big windows. For the front of the house, it's a little different in that all the windows are mauled together with the exception of the windows in the foyer. And the reason we did that is because it's impossible to make the interior and the exterior of a window assembly with a door in the middle of it it's impossible to make all that line up. You pick the lesser of two evils. Either you want the inside lines to be straight and line up, or you want the outside lines to be straight and line up, but there's no in between. But mulling this together in the foyer, we actually didn't directly mull it. We actually added dividers out of two by six that separate the windows and glass. You'll see when this house is finished why exactly we did that and how the trim's gonna line up on both interior and exterior. So the only thing to do after the windows was install the door. This is the last thing we did for a reason because it's a pain in the butt and it's heavy. So we started by prepping the opening by installing some Huber zip tape on the jams and the floor. And we used stretch tape, which is another product by Huber in the corners here and made sure everything was overlapping nicely and made sure the floor was clean. And once that was prepped, we had to install an aluminum sill pan that we had custom made. And to do that, the returns on the side, we bent in the field and then we adhered it to the floor and then we adhered it to itself in an overlapping fashion. Once that was done, the opening was officially prepped and then we had to assemble the frame to this door, which is pretty heavy and definitely cumbersome and awkward. So the first thing to do was to prep the sill 
And the sill on a door this big is in two pieces. This is extruded aluminum sill. So the first thing you have to do is literally fill the voids completely where the two sill parts come together. So water can't travel from the left side to the right side where those two pieces come together. So we sealed that up completely. And then we have to seal both the ends on the far left and the far right side of the sill. And we did that with adhesive that is able to be submersed. That's very important. <laughs> a lesson we've learned in the past here, it has to be sealant that is submersible. Once that was all done and we were confident that it was sealed up well, we went ahead and started building the frame by installing the left and right uprights and then the head track, which the head track is also in two pieces due to the length, but it doesn't need to be sealed near as well as the sill. So pretty simple. This frame is very rigid, but it's so long that it still flexes. So we, you'll see us here, we install some temporary supports in the middle of this frame before we stand it up. And that's just to make sure it doesn't bow in the center and tweak things. Once that was done, we start by following the manufacturer's instructions here and laying a bead of sealant all the way across the back of the sill where it meets the sill pan, and then another line somewhere in the middle, and then a broken line of sealant in the front. And the reason is if water ever gets in there, you need it to be able to escape. So I think we did a four foot bead, two inch space, four foot bead, two inch space, and so on and so forth. Once that's done and the sealant is still malleable, we have to get it in the hole. And that's the hardest part about installing this door. So we made sure it was plumb level. Uh, we cross checked it with a string to make sure it was not twisted or anything. Once that's done, we lifted up the door panels one by one. And these start by installing the innermost panels and then staggering as you install from the indoors to outdoors, the rest of the panels. There's eight panels on this door. Now that everything's installed, all that's left to do is just to adjust the doors. And since you have a short leg on the bottom, these are four foot wide by 10 foot tall. Even if you lift one side of one door a 30 second, it may be out a quarter inch at the top. So it's really kind of finicky to get these adjusted right and everything to be plumb and true, each panel line up with each other and whatnot. And if you don't get that right, then these doors will have a really hard time locking. So it's a pretty important step, but it's pretty straightforward as well. Our long-awaited septic materials have finally arrived, and the grader, our neighbor Jody, has come up to install it. While he was here, he also did some additional work because we're long on big boulders and short on flat land. So we had him build a retaining wall behind our garage out of the stone we had laying around from the excavation of the garage. It's two tiers and gives us the flat spot we needed for our raised garden beds. These garden beds are super nice. We got them from Veggio Garden, they come flat packed, so we had to do some assembly. The biggest pain in the butt was probably pulling all the plastic off of these panels, but I understand they needed it there to protect the finish during shipping. The assembly is pretty straightforward, but I would recommend that you have at least two people to do this, especially with these larger beds. We stored these in the garage until we had a spot ready for them, and they were actually kind of useful in there while we were painting all the fascia. Once the retaining wall was done, we took some measurements and laid out where the beds would go and started bringing them up and the excavator filled them with some native soil, which includes a lot of rocks, just for the bottom couple feet. These beds are 32 inches tall, so for the top foot or so, we'll fill that up with topsoil and compost. Next, we installed the air conditioner. This was a first time experience for us. Well, most of this for me is a first time experience, but the DIY mini split system was also new for David. It was actually pretty easy. Although looking back, there were some things we would have done differently, which I'll get into in a minute. The first thing we did was figure out exactly where all the indoor units go. And since we had these planned out in the design from day one, this was pretty easy. Next, we temporarily mounted some drywall and marked up our templates. 
These kits come with templates where you just place it where you want the unit to go and you can mark your holes and go from there. We did have to add some blocking here and there to catch the screws that hold the air handlers up, but that was pretty easy. Once the plates were mounted, then we could hang the units on them. This is where things got a little tricky. Since we placed a lot of these units right above openings, there wasn't much room to play with. But basically, the unit comes with about two feet of condensate drain and line sets already attached. And then it's got a coupler with pre-charged lines. So the hardest part about this was the unit we have in the living room because the line sets had to go around a header, above a header, through a top plate, down a joist, and then through like 20 eye joists to get to the outdoor unit. We tried to drill as small of a hole through the eye joist as we could, but looking back, we should have just went bigger to make things a little easier. It was so tight, in fact, that we had to strip off some of the factory installed insulation off of the line sets. Well, actually it got torn up trying to get them through, and then we had to replace it later, which wasn't fun. The rest of them were nowhere near as challenging. You'll see we have three units that all converge in one stud bay, go down, and then outside where we wall mounted our compressor. We had our friends at BTL Welding and Relics Fabrication custom make this mount for us because we felt like the ones available online were insufficient considering the amount of wind potential we have up here. So we had that made, we painted it and hung it, and the unit sits on it nicely and it feels really strong. After the air conditioner, we mounted our water heater. We don't really have the space or want to deal with it inside, so we went with an outdoor unit. The reason we hung this along with our air conditioner now is so we can lay out our blocking for our siding. So when we start laying our lap siding, we already have those trim pieces in place and we can just go right up to them instead of running the lap siding first and having to cut out and install blocking and install the condenser and water heater later. The trim we put around the water heater had a drop spot below it where you can still see the green zip board and that's because we're going to build an enclosure to keep the exposed piping on the exterior of the house from freezing. Once the fascia was all done, we could start installing the soffit. But before we do that, we need to stain it. Uh, we always like to pre-stain everything. That way the painters don't have to climb up on ladders and paint above their head for, you know, 14 days to get all the stains. So we set everything up on saw horses and just stained away for a couple days it took us. It's a lot of soffit. And then once we make our cuts during installation, you'll notice us staining the ends of the boards too. To, that way when it's expansion and contraction happens and those gaps open up a little bit, what you see in the gaps is, is still finished. In preparation for the arrival of the electricians, we went ahead and knocked out some of their work for them. That way we could save a little on labor costs and also just to help them get the job done faster since everyone is super busy right now. So we came out and measured and marked out the placement for all the lights on the floor. Once we were satisfied with those, we used a laser from those marks to install the can light housings in the ceiling. And these are just little pieces of metal that the light pops into once the drywall is done. There is some tweaking involved here Nothing works out to plan 100% of the time. You might have conflicts with joists or framing and whatnot, but most of it worked out pretty well, except for a couple of lights in my office that just coincidentally happened to fall right in the dead center of a ceiling joist, and one in our laundry room, which was the same scenario. The easy fix for this would have been to just shift the placement of these few lights, but David is very particular about the symmetry of the light layout, 
and symmetry in general. And I appreciate that because it really is one of those things that you might not notice right off, but getting all the little details right makes a huge difference in the end. So we went to the store and got new joists, moved the problem joist over and split the difference. So instead of one joist right in the center, now we have two joists on either side of the light. For the exterior lights, we made some blocking out of our siding material, which is 5 quarter LP smart siding. We already know which lights we're using, so we make these just slightly bigger than the base of the light. We place these at six and a half feet, which seemed appropriate given the height of some of these windows. Once those are all placed, the electricians know where to bring their wire for the lighting outside. Another thing we tackled ourselves is the venting for the dryer, exhaust fans, and kitchen hood. And we went ahead and installed the vent covers on the exterior. We also placed all of our outlet boxes and other electrical boxes in the house before the electricians got here. Some of these don't contain any actual power at all. They're just for audio, computer monitor, or home theater wiring. So we placed those boxes and went ahead and pulled the wire through the wall for all of those. So now onto the siding. We're not done with this yet, but we've made pretty significant progress on it. The first thing we did was frame around the windows and doors with three and a half inch LP smart siding, uh, five quarter again. I pocket screwed and glued these. That way they were a little more solid and the joints weren't misaligned. So I made those first and then hung them up and nailed them in place. And then we installed the belly band is what we call it around the bottom of the house. It's a 12 inch piece of five quarter siding trim that goes all the way around the bottom of the house. We're basically just setting ourselves up and tackling all the trim and then we'll tackle the lap siding and then we'll be done. So once all the trim was done, we went ahead and started the lap siding on the house. And the only place this is different is the garage. We wanted the siding to appear to go to the dirt. So on the garage to go over the block, we had to fur out uh, with half inch pressure treated plywood strips that we cut. We had to fur out the wall. That way we could take the siding down over the wood framing and over the concrete block and appear to go straight to the ground. Uh, when you do this, you need to add some sort of screening at the top and the bottom of the wall. That way bugs don't have a hotel behind your siding. So we installed this first at the garage on the bottom and up against the soffit. And then we laid our plywood strips vertically using traditional and masonry nails. And then we could start laying our siding on the garage. While the guys were doing the lap siding, Courtney and I started tackling the mahogany accent siding on the house. The first thing we did is mill everything in our shop and then brought it out to the site, sanded everything down and clear coated it. We're using an exterior water-based clear coat from General Finishes. I believe it's General Finishes Exterior 450. Good stuff so far. It's the same stuff we've sprayed on our doors and any other exterior wood, and it seems to hold up pretty well, and it sprays very easily. We're using a Fuji four-stage Mini Mite turbine sprayer to get all this on here. This sprayer is awesome, and it's very forgiving, well worth the money. While we were tackling the siding, the metal fabricator showed up to tackle our handrails. This was something I originally planned on doing myself, but Sean and Brandon are good friends of mine and they hooked me up with her a pretty good price. So the way we did this is all the handrails are mounted to the band board of the deck and there are no corners. The corners are postless corners. So there's some pretty serious fabrication going on here and everything has to be pretty accurate so it all lines up. And Sean and Brandon are used to this and they could do it way more efficiently than I could. They brought their welders out and a generator and made everything on site. Sometimes we'll powder coat these, but 
for my house, I figured painting was good enough. So they started fabricating in their shop, brought out some prefabricated sections, and then connected them in the field by welding the pickets from section to section. Once that was done, we cleaned all the metal and primered it, and then later on, we'll be painting it black. All right, guys, that's it for this video. Make sure you stay tuned for the next video. We're gonna cover the installation of the mahogany accent siding you saw in this video, as well as the installation of our roof, which we've been procrastinating on due to some high wind uh, for the last few weeks. And you'll also see us prep for exterior paint as well as probably get into some actual painting, possibly interior insulation, and maybe even drywall. So that's it for now. See ya. See ya. Wookie, wookie, let's go. Wookie, let's go.